Garden Success is brought to you in part by the Arbor Gate, featuring unusual plants, artisan-created decorative pieces, and a constantly changing array of items that bring beauty, comfort, and even flavor to the home and garden. Arbor Gate, 15635 FM 2920, Tomball, Texas, 281-351-8851 or arborgate.com. Garden Success is also brought to you by the Farm Patch, 3519 South College Avenue in Bryan, 979-822-7209. Welcome to Garden Success with Skip Richter, the show designed to help you have a bountiful garden and a beautiful landscape. Call in now with your lawn and garden questions at 979-845-5689 or email your questions to gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And now, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Horticulturist, Skip Richter. Well, hello and welcome to Garden Success. We are looking forward today to talking anything gardening you want to talk about. We can talk lawns or trees or vegetables or flowers. What are your questions? What would you like to ask? And if you uh, will write down our number, you can call and ask. It's 979-845-5689. 845-5689. I like to say that to make the... Uh, Listeners more comfortable, there's no stupid questions, just stupid answers, and I'll worry about the stupid answers part. How about that? Well, we are fortunate to be graced again with the man, the legend himself, Mark Edwards. You forgot the word myth. <laughs> uh, no, you're a mister. Uh, I, I, <laughs> sorry. Well, Ed, that's an old joke. You know, what's a myth? As good as the mile? Something, something <laughs> like that, anyway. Uh, how are uh, you, Skip? I'm well. How are you? I'm retired, Skip. <laughs> yeah. How, how, how could I be better? I no. was <laughs> expecting Bermuda shorts, but it is a little cool. I, you uh, know, all my Bermuda <laughs> shorts are in the laundry, so I'm, you oh, know, okay. I'm, I'm having trouble keeping up with my laundry. Anyway. Um, what's happening in the weather? Uh, a whole bunch of nothing would be the answer to that question. Right. Uh, if you were looking for a more typical mid-October weather pattern, you'd be hard-pressed to find it around here. I mean, we're yeah. stuck in the mid-80s for the daytimes and the... Uh, excuse me, never clear your throat on the, ra on the radio, by the way. Yeah, I saw something uh, with a 9 on it on the horizon. You I didn't you like did. that. Uh, let's see, I'm looking. Da, 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 da. Yeah, I don't see that. Skip. Okay. I, I'm, I'm seeing 85s, 86s. Today, 88 is well, the warmest of the next seven. I'm probably perusing lesser prognosticators than yourself. Or you so. may have been peeking at a Houston forecast because, you, you know, you are from the south, after all. <laughs> the I-10 no. corridor, as you will. My uh, oh, my God. Uh, however, folks who are looking forward to a little bit of rainfall to help their gardening and yardening are going to be mm, wishing a little harder, I think. A slight okay. chance of a shower on Saturday and the early morning hours on Sunday. Aside from that, it looks like it's going to be very quiet, uh, kind of warm, uh, not terribly humid. We've got sort of a little uh, northerly flow going over the next few days, mm -hmm. so it'll be, humidity levels will be down and temperature levels will be nice. You know, if, if, if I were still a golfer, which I'm not, but I will encourage folks who like to do things outdoors, now's a good time to do it, because it's, uh, it's not yeah. bad weather. A little picnic weather, as we used to call it back in Missouri. It does a lot for us to get out in the outdoors. And yep. I, that's almost like a trite saying, but it, it's true. Oh, yeah. yeah absolutely. Science is proving that just <laughs> getting out and smelling fresh air and looking at plants and, I mean, it just it, it has effect. Just it's getting off the couch. Significant and measurable uh, benefit psychologically. Sure, as well absolutely. As well, then the lack of boredom factor is not the least among those. Um, right. Speaking of which, since we are, after all, talking on a gardening show, I mean, this time of year when the weather is kind of boring and mm -hmm. the temperatures are nice and moderate, what the heck are we doing? Are we planting? Are we preparing? What are we doing? We're puttering. We're puttering. puttering. That's, Ooh, that another is, one of those technical uh, it's gardening a, terms. It's, it's a horticultural term, <laughs> which means something's happening, but I don't, just don't know quite what. Okay. Actually, right now we're planting our fall vegetable garden. Okay. Okay. We're starting our cool season flowers uh, garden planting. Such as, such as. Well, and now would be a good time to begin planting, or not, I shouldn't say begin, but stock uh, is a flower, and snapdragons okay. are, are another one that can plant. Alyssum could be going out now. We hold off a little bit for the real cold tolerant flowers like pansies and violas. They need a little, a little bit cooler for them to do their best. I mean, it wouldn't be the end of the world to plant them now, but... 
Uh, so those stocks, let's see, Snapdragons, Alyssum, Calendula, Nasturtiums, there's a number of things you could put in. Okay, so you've covered the decorative side. Now, when you mentioned fall and approaching winter vegetables yes. type things, what are we doing there? Transplants of anything with that blue-green leaf, broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, Brussels okay. sprouts, kale, uh, okay. collards, those all can go. Now, these are, these are tossing seeds in the ground, or we're taking transplants from inside and moving them outside? Well, you could plant seeds, but I think at this point in the season, you're probably better off with transplants plants okay. because they give you faster results mm -hmm. uh, and those are those are good and cold hardy uh, lettuce is you know you can start trying with lettuce it, it's a cool season plant but it'll it'll come up in this weather well as a person who was born with a black thumb as we've discussed many times in the past i promise not to go out and destroy any plants of course living in a condominium that kind of takes the pressure off because because yeah. well, <laughs> i don't have to do that stuff so i promise not to kill any plants but for everybody else out there who's listening right it will <laughs> As you've heard me say before, there's no black thumbs. There's uneducated thumbs. Oh, okay. And that's why we're here. You're letting me off the hook is we, what you're doing. We can turn any <laughs> thumb green if you'll just follow a few simple uh, procedures. So. And that's why we tune into your show at noon every Thursday uh, every week. That or what's he going to say today? Uh, yeah. Curiosity I, might be another. You know, people gather when there's going to be a train ride. That's or, true. Yeah, okay. uh, personally, I'm, I'm waiting for the harmonica solo. I mean, I, I know one of these days you're going to bring the harmonica in and we're going to be yeah. truly entertained. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. there you go, Skip. Boring weather, pleasant weather. Good time to get outside and do some stuff. Good to see you. And Thanks. you, sir. Have Thanks a great for show. Thanks your head in the door. Thank you, sir. All right. Well, it'll be a good show if you give us a call. It's 845-5689, 845-5689, or by email at gardensuccess at T-A-M-U dot E-D-U. Gardensuccess, that's one word, at T-A-M-U dot E-D-U. So let's get some calls earlier in the show today. I know a lot of times toward the end we, we get a flood of calls and can't quite handle them all. I like to give callers a little bit of time where we can visit and, and explore the question a little bit further. So the, the sooner you call, the better better off that is. Uh, my goodness, it's, uh, it's weather that we can be planting almost anything. I, I've said before, fall is the best season to plant. There are very few exceptions to the statement, fall is the best season to plant. Uh, and, you know, you, it's not the best season to plant basil or sweet corn, for example, of course, but it's the best season for trees and shrubs and woody vines, uh, for uh, perennials, and, and that includes the perennial herbs, which we have a lot of. Uh, there's a whole host of things you can plant in the fall in the vegetable garden. If you go to our local Master Gardeners website, uh, that is um, Brazos MG, uh, that you can get to our vegetable garden planting date chart. It's free. You can look at it online. You can print it out if you want. Print yourself a copy. Put it on the refrigerator. It tells you what to plant and when, the best time to plant, and the uh, okay times to plant, and maybe the time in general you're not going to have as great success uh, for planting. Uh, so that that's available for free. So if you if you uh, are interested in vegetable gardening, yes, all the blue leaf vegetables I mentioned those, and and I mentioned a couple of the greens, lettuce and and, uh, but also um, uh, spinach very soon uh, is is going to do well. I, I would go ahead and start planting it now. Uh, be a, a little on the warm side for its its ideal temperature, but it's a great time to plant it. All those root crops, uh, things like carrots and radishes and beets and, and uh, uh, turnips, all those type of root crops can be planted now as well. Uh, they, uh, in fact, you need to go ahead and, and get those in soon uh, for, for the best results. Uh, they like cooler weather. You want to make sure they have a loose soil. And just a, a couple of notes, uh, you always want to read the seed packet when you plant seeds and make sure that you're planting them properly and spacing them properly. Um, if the, uh, the seed packet gives you a spacing, go by that because you want to make sure that, uh, that they, they're not overcrowded because otherwise the results just, just won't be as good. But, but two vegetables of special note, and that's carrots and lettuce, those you moisten the soil well, have a nice fine textured seed bed for them, and that moisten the soil well, sprinkle them on the surface, and just, just sort of press them up against the surface, and then maybe mist them again, uh, and keep them moist as best you can. We usually put a row cover over them or something for ideal germination conditions, because they need light to germinate. So you bury those seeds a half inch under the ground, and they're just not going to come up well. 
Uh, so put those two, carrots and lettuce, stick those on the surface or barely cover them. Well, let's go to the phones now and talk to Dr. Try or Tree? Uh, Trip. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry to butcher your name. <laughs> Dr. <Right>. Tree. <laughs> Yes. Just leave it at Dr. Tripp. So I'm a long-time listener, but first-time caller. Good. So, you know, I have septic system at my house, and there is an area which is remains watered all the year round. Mm -hmm. My question was, can I plant fruit trees in that area, and will it be safe to eat those fruits that, you know, the area has been watered by the discharge from the septic system? Right. For, for your home septic systems, we're not as worried about like heavy, heavy metal buildup uh, so much in the soil. Uh, and the microbial issues would be more of a concern with vegetables. You know, if the soil is splashing onto a lettuce leaf and, and it has maybe some mi microbes that are of human uh, health concern, uh, that would be an issue. But on the fruit trees, you shouldn't have much of a, a significant issue. The problem, though, with fruit trees is almost all of our fruit wants really well-drained soil. And sometimes those uh, fields, is this, a, is this a septic underground drain field, or do you have sprayers that come up and spray the surface? Uh, they spray the surface. Okay. Yeah, well, there, I'm going to back off a little bit on my comment on fruit. Uh, there you can get mist and things like that that are... Um, uh, floating around and so I might be a little concerned about that certainly if you bring the fruit in wash it well uh, that that reduces concerns but um, with that mist going around uh, that that might be a little bit of a concern but one of my most practical concerns would be the the lack of good soil drainage roots mm -hmm. roots need oxygen and uh, when the soil stays too saturated a lot of our fruit trees get really unhappy mm. So you are not concerned about the chlorine and the chemicals getting uh, into the fruits. So are you? Are those systems charged with chlorine? The septic systems? Yeah, we use chlorine tablets. Okay, you know what? That is outside my league. I'm sorry. I, I'm not aware. I thought that that was just an affluent. Uh, that had settled out, and now the spray was was putting it out on the surface. I didn't realize that chlorine was used. Yeah. If chlorine is used at a moderate rate, and again, I don't understand those systems, so I can't say. If it's a moderate rate, it won't be a problem. But if it is an excessive rate to shock the system, for example, uh, then that might be a problem for the for the fruit trees. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I have learned a lot listening to you. Okay, well, I... You, you you about half stumped me on this one, so I do appreciate the call. <laughs> Good talking to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tripp. Bye-bye. Uh, Bye-bye. Our phone number, 845-5689, 845-5689, or by email, gardensuccess at tamu.edu, gardensuccess at tamu.edu. Dot edu. Let's talk a little more about some vegetables. Uh, we uh, Green onions, multiplying onions, those kinds of things can be planted now. Uh, if you're seeding onions, planting them from seed, you can get those in now, although it's a little on the late side uh, in this area. Uh, you can go ahead and put some seeds out, but I would I would start your onions if if I, if I were you wanting good success and results, I would wait until probably January and and put out the little uh, transplants that come in a bundle, little pencil sized transplants. Uh, put those out in January, and uh, I think you'll have your best your best uh, results with onions on those. Uh, so anyway, uh, our warm season veggies are still doing okay. I've got some tomatoes that are still producing. Uh, chard, for example, is still is loving this weather and doing really well. Uh, if you've planted them in a fall garden, things like cucumbers and squash are still producing some, some for you, although they're slowing down a lot. Uh, but there's a lot of things we can do. Now, if you've got um, very frost-sensitive crops that are long-term, like a, a sweet potato, for example, you probably want to dig those. Some people wait until the first frost, but as those roots grow underground and sort of heave up the soil, they open up cracks where colder air can reach the surface of that. And if we had a really hard freeze, you could get some damage to the, the roots. They are, they are not cold hardy down there. Uh, so you might want to start considering digging those up. Uh, you don't need to wait till frost. In fact, I'd recommend you don't. Uh, unless you just got a really late planting and you're trying to give them every second you can.
to, to build more roots. Uh, but sweet potatoes could be planted now with those. You want to uh, dust them off, don't wash them. Just knock off the soil and then put them in a place where it's warm and humid and they can cure. Uh, that sort of sets the skin a little bit better and then their storage life will be very, very good for you over over time. So those are all some things to do. Uh, always in the cool season, we want to remind people you need to use a little bit extra of the nitrogen on plants that need extra nitrogen uh, because the soil is cool, microbial activity is slowed down, so don't forget to do a little fertilizing in the fall. Uh, the exception would be our cool season peas. That would be like English peas and snow peas and sugar snap peas, those kinds of things. Edible potted, I should say, instead of sugar snap. Um, the, um, the cool season peas, like warm season legumes, don't need extra nitrogen, excessive nitrogen, because uh, maybe a little is needed, maybe not, uh, but if you, if you push them with it, you end up not getting the uh, productivity that that you're wanting to get. So be a little careful with those. In the flower garden, uh, we were talking earlier with, with um, um, Mark about uh, some flowers. And when you put these transplants in, whether they're flowers or vegetables, uh, give them a little bit of a soluble fertilizer solution. Kind of get them off to a good start. You know, it's just not dry fertilizer in the planting hole or the, where you dig it out to put the little sets in, transplants in. Uh, but uh, a soluble thing. You pour over the top, extremely diluted, very low concentration. Again, follow the label. And that helps them get started, off to a good start. I usually do that at planting to water them in. And then maybe a week later I'll do it. And occasionally I'll do it again a week after that. Uh, but just kind of getting them going. Uh, the ultimate goal, though, is not to have to fertilize them every week, but to have a soil condition where there's plenty of nutrients to supply them. And the way you do that is by having your soil tested. Uh, it's real easy. We live so close to the soil lab in, the, in Brazos County, we just run over there and drop it off. Uh, or you can mail it in, but a soil test will tell you your pH and your levels of nutrients. The basic soil test covers the big uh, most um, the, the nutrients that are used in the largest quantities and you can also get some of the the minor or micronutrients uh, that are is equally important but used in much lower quantities uh, but generally the regular standard soil test is going to take care of you for your garden occasionally we'll we'll need to drill down a little bit further than that but but not not usually but the reason I, I mentioned the soil test is there's a lot of fertilizers out there and a lot of blends and they have names on them telling you what plant to put them on sometimes and, and so on. Uh, you just need to remember that when you're when you are um, fertilizing your soil, if you don't know what's already in your soil, then how can you know what to put on? If your phosphorus was really low and you didn't add much phosphorus, you put a low middle number product, uh, then you would be missing the mark. If your phosphorus was really high and you put triple 13 or triple 10 or something like that on, then you would also be missing the mark because you've already got uh, maybe too much of that middle number. And I, I'm, I'm not picking on phosphorus, it's just an example. That could be true of magnesium and potassium and, and a lot of other nutrients, inclu including micronutrients. So start with a soil test so that you're not fertilizing blind. Uh, and then you can put on the right amount. If you have any questions after you get your soil test results, you can call the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Office in Brazos County. That's where I am. And uh, give us a call. We can, we can help interpret it and suggest things. Maybe you're, maybe, uh, you know, you are wanting to fertilize organically or something. We can look at some of the nutrient options that, that you might have for that. Or just uh, and help reading and interpreting the test. I'm happy to do that. Uh, but once you get your soil right, everything else is gonna gonna do well. Uh, you don't. This is you know hydroponic growing, where plants are growing in a stream of water, with the perfect ratio of nutrients all together in it. That that works. But somebody is having to monitor that constantly to make sure that it's that it's right, that the nutrient balance and content is all right. When we garden, we want to create a soil that is just a nice bank account of everything that that, that plant needs in, a, in an appropriate ratio. And when we do that, we don't have to worry about day by day is what is a plant needing fertilizing and whatever. We, we've built that kind of soil. Now sure, over time, we tend to add a little bit of nitrogen here and there through a, through a plant's growth cycle at certain points. 
but uh, because nitrogen is so volatile and tends to to uh, you know volatilize away or, or wash away down in, into the root zone too far. Uh, if it's excessive moisture, uh, the microbes take it up, tie it up for a while, and then release it again. So nitrogen's a moving target, but but uh, in general, a soil test is the way to go. And I know I spent a lot of time on this over the course of the year, but it's it's just so important. It's just, we want you to, when you garden, we want you to have success. You know, joking with Mark about a, a black thumb and a green thumb, or a brown thumb, whichever you call yours, um, it's really, it, it, it's, not a, it's not super secrets to being able to garden and grow things well. It's following a few basic principles. And, uh, and if you do that, you can have success. Gardens need sunlight. When you give them less sunlight, you have less success. Uh, gardens need good drainage, and uh, they need soil that's moist but not soggy wet. Uh, you get that right. You want soil that has a good texture so that you have a very extensive root system that is able to reach down into the soil and, and mine nutrients and, and moisture from a larger area of soil. Uh, choosing the right varieties that are going to do well here and then planting them at the right time. And I talked about our vegetable garden planting date chart that's available online free. Uh, just uh, Those are just more and more of the principles. And as you do this, uh, don't expect total success the first year you try it. Just keep working with it, uh, learning a little as you go, and you will find that you can grow a lot of things. And the next thing you know, you're going to be... Uh, so addicted to gardening, then you're trying to grow all those things that don't grow here and giving them the, you know, how do you make an azalea happy in Brazos County? Well, it's possible, but I, 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 as a general rule, I don't recommend it. But when you have gardeners, you've got people trying to do everything. They're hauling blue spruce back from Colorado <laughs> from the summer vacation. Uh, boy, what a, what a painful death. The Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Plants needs to meet you at the, at the uh, Texas state line and, <laughs> and take that plant away, send it back to Colorado. <laughs> but anyway, the, the, the idea is we, we have fun when we garden. Uh, we try to grow new things. We experience new things. I've been doing this uh, as, as a, as a, a, a vocation for 33 years now with AgriLife Extension. Uh, as a gardener, I, you know, as a kid, I gardened with my family in the family garden, and uh, I was in charge of uh, pulling weeds, especially when uh, I misbehaved. I got to go out and pull weeds. It's a wonder I became a horticulturist. But uh, and by the way, we have we had a very weed-free garden, which might tell you a little bit about me as a child. <laughs> I got a lot of weed pulling opportunities. But you know, I've been where I was going with that is I've been doing this 33 years and every week I learn something. It it as long as you're out there pushing the edge of things, you're going to learn something. This summer I tried some new greens that I'd never grown before that are from parts of the world that are sultry and hot and tropical and they were so happy to be in Bryan College Station in July and August and they did really well here. Uh, there, there's always a new plant you haven't grown. There's always a new gardening system or technique you haven't tried. Uh, gardening keeps you young. It really does. Uh, just from a standpoint of get moving physically, uh, the mental, uh, mental benefits of it, the uh, mental, emotional benefits of it, uh, and just the fact that you're out learning and engaging. And one of the best parts of gardening is gardeners. You know, gardeners gather together as do people that enjoy any particular hobby. And you just have the opportunity to visit with folks, make some good friends. I think some of the best people on earth are gardeners. Uh, and y you, you learn from them, uh, you share plants with them, and it just all around, uh, I can't recommend a better, a better hobby than gardening. Of course, I'm biased, but I'm also right on that one, uh, despite being biased. Well, they say don't run on monologues because then people won't pick up the phone. So I'm going to shut up. Uh, the number is 845-5689-845-5689 or by email at gardensuccess at tamu.edu. So let's talk to you about what you're interested in. I, I want to mention something. I don't know, it was probably a week ago. Uh, I was talking with John about some uh, plumeria fertilizers, and I made a statement about, uh, you know, that a fertilizer with a plant name on it isn't necessarily the best fertilizer for that plant. It's built with the kinds of 
of nutrients in the that a plant most needs uh, in 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 terms of how much of them is in the fertilizer. But it, if your soil already has it, it isn't. But when you're looking at something like a plumeria, which is often in a container, that's a little different thing. And you can find, and I, I don't think I mentioned this uh, with the phone call, but so I did want to come back and sort of correct it, that with plumerias, if you look at a plumeria fertilizer, the nitrogen level is fairly low. They need nitrogen. They need, they need plenty of nitrogen, but you don't want to over push them with growth. When you over push them with growth, uh, you don't get the blooming production like you want to. The phosphorus levels in a plumeria fertilizer are high. That's that's an important one for plants that are making flowers. It's Plants need all the nutrients, but that's one they especially need for blooming. And then a medium amount of potassium is usually pretty good. Of course, a little bit of um, a little bit of magnesium is always needed here and there. Uh, and there are a few fertilizers out there. I'm not going to mention brand names, but fertilizers that kind of tell you in the name that they're going to they're going to really help you have more blooms on your plants that that may be a good mix but think of a low high medium type ratio for your your containerized uh, plumeria and you might you know you might fertilize them um, twice a month or, or even even once a month uh, depending on how they're doing uh, but yeah, you can you can improve the performance on those. Uh, let's go to the phones now and talk to Jenny. Hello, Jenny. Hey, Skip. How are you doing? I'm well, thank you. Good. Listen, uh, listening to you today, it reminded me that I did have a question. Um, I was bad. Um, I, I know a lot <laughs> yeah, of us okay. Then, now we've become the True Confessions Gardening Show. So here we yes, go. Yes, yes. You know how it is. You go out and you go to a little garden center. And you say you're not going to buy anything, oh but you do. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Yeah, yes, yes. Well, I bought a Mexican honeysuckle. Lovely little plant. You know, I know it makes a nice bush shape with those beautiful little orange flowers. Mm-hmm. But when I went online to figure out where to plant it, I got two different versions of where to plant it. Okay. Full sun, said one. Uh-huh. Sun shade, said another. So I'd like a little advice on that. Please. Okay, Mexican honeysuckle, by the way, that's a great plant. Uh, it, it is really popular as you go a little west of here toward central Texas, I-35 mm-hmm. corridor in there. Uh, but you can grow them very well here. And they do want good drainage. That's important. Okay. Um, they, they don't like wet feet. Of course, a lot of plants don't, but they, they especially don't. Uh, as far as sun, I've seen them growing in absolutely full sun, and I've seen them uh, doing okay in partial shade. If you okay. go into too much shade, you're just not going to have good success in terms of bloom production on those. But they are, I would say they're, they're somewhat shade tolerant. All right, then I, I've got the perfect spot for them. And yeah. uh, like you were saying, you know, now is the time to put out the seeds and things for that spring garden. Mm-hmm. So I've been following Vita Sackville West's program of tossing those seeds over my shoulder. You know, the poppy seeds, the larkspur, all okay. those little things. And I'm looking forward to a great spring bloom. <laughs> well, good. Good. That's fun. <laughs> That's fun. I think I talked to uh, the other day about, uh, you know, we need a, a Johnny poppy seed here in Texas. <laughs> uh, I, t- I took a picture of some in a crack in a sidewalk in, in a small town. It was Lockhart, Texas, actually. Uh, between the curb and the asphalt, uh, there was a little uh, Flandersville corn poppy coming up. And just seeing it there made me think, you know what, somebody needs to do more of that. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if the city would agree, but... <laughs> well, it's, it's one of those charming little flowers that really makes you feel like, oh, it's spring. That's right. New life. That yeah. is right. All right. Well, thank you so much, sir. You All have right. a lovely day. Jenny, okay. thank you for the call. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Our phone number is 845-5689, 845-5689, or by email at gardensuccess at tamu.edu. Uh, and by the way, for those of you who are thinking, what is Mexican honeysuckle? Well, it's not a vine. You know, we think of honeysuckles or vines, but this is a, a, like a little sh- perennial shrub, small shrub, perennial though. Uh, I don't think it's about three feet tall. And uh, they they do okay in a little bit of shade, but they also do well in sun. It's got the tubular blooms that, uh, you know, anytime something is tubular and red, you probably are going to have hummingbirds coming to check it out. Uh, but even other pollinators will come to them. Uh, they do need to be sheared like a lot of our perennials. You know, a lot of things we grow look great, a few, you know, for the 
first few weeks or month or so after you plant them as they build this beautiful little plant. And then as they age over time, especially perennials, they tend to get lanky and floppy and scraggly and you know kind of woody looking uh, and they don't do as well. And you can prune any of these back well to, to create bushiness. And in fact, I think we should. Uh, things like Salvia gregii, that's a pretty common salvia. Uh, but it's a subshrub, and and uh, if you will cut it back at the end of winter significantly, maybe leave six inches or so, depending on you know your goals for the plant. But cut it back significantly, and it'll come out and bloom like crazy. And then by the time you get to about May, another light shearing, maybe a quarter inch, a quarter of the plant back, uh, and fertilize and water. And here we go again; it blooms more. And so many of our perennials are blooming on the terminal shoots. That's true of Mexican honeysuckle too, by the way. Uh, but uh, salvias are that way. Roses are, are that way. And so if you've got one shoot coming up, it can have one bloom or one bloom cluster if it's that type of flower. And if you cut that back, now you're going to get two or maybe three or more shoots that come out from cutting it back. And each of those is, is then another terminal branch that can have more blooms. And so by shearing periodically, uh, you, you are creating a denser, more compact plant with more blooms. Now there's nothing wrong with letting something just grow wild if that's, what, if that's the look you want. But just don't be afraid to cut things back. Uh, we, we tend to think I planted it and now it's not looking so good. Why? Or it's a bad plant or whatever. And it, it just we just need to shear back more. And that's true of a lot of our plants. So think about that uh, when you're out there, especially things in the mint family like the salvias, for example. They just do really well uh, with periodic shearing uh, to cut them back. Let's see, what were we talking about a while ago? I was on a, a discussion of something, and now it's, it's escaping me. Well, let me go to the emails. We had a, an email come in from Ron. Ron's got an area that's down by a pond, and it's very flat. Uh, of course, it's above water, uh, but it's, it's pretty low and flat, relatively so. And a, a, an old oak tree that was there died, probably a post oak from the looks of it but it's right now a dead oak. Um, and so uh, Ron's looking for another uh, tree to put in that area. And there, there are a lot of different kinds of, of plants and trees that you can use uh, in an area like that. Uh, I would I, probably the, and, and here's where, I, I always, there's so many plants I'd love to recommend, but you're gonna have trouble finding them. And what, what good is that, right? Well, here's some that are, may be findable, but uh, not not easy uh, to find. But uh, there are two oaks. One is a nuttall oak, N-U-T-T-A-L-L, -L, nuttall. I believe I spelled that right. Uh, and it is, uh, think of it as just your typical red oak. Like if you've seen Schumard oaks, that, those kind of leaves, uh, that's what a nuttall oak is going to be like. And But nuttall can take uh, very wet conditions. Uh, it's very happy in southeast Texas where occasionally you get some periods where it's very soggy uh, and it does it does really well there. Uh, another one like that would be overcup oak and overcup is named for because of the acorns form. You know how normally if I had you draw an acorn you'd draw the little acorn itself with a little cap on top. Uh, the hat, if you will. Well, an overcup, that cap or hat on the acorn, it reaches all the way around the acorn and almost closes on the other side. You just have a little bit of the acorn sticking out uh, on the end uh, from the cap. That's why it's called overcup uh, oaks. That's another species that is really um, tolerant of periodic extra wet spells. So that would be something to consider. Now in the photos, I can't tell exactly how moist or how deep that soil is or how high above the water line it is. So there may be many other things uh, that you could put there and they would do well. If you get them up above the soggy zone uh, and the roots can get down and get to a dependable supply of moisture, there are gonna be a lot of trees that are very happy with that. Uh, so, but those are, those are two. And again, you're not gonna, you're probably gonna have trouble finding them locally. Uh, there are some of our uh, some of the garden centers that uh, really specialize uh, in in plants that aren't so common. Uh, the you know the, you might find something like that uh, as you go out to Rose Emporium or down in 
Uh, Arbor Gate and Tomballs carries a lot of unusual things like that. Uh, or maybe a local garden center can also order it for you. Uh, you might ask and see if that's possible. But these are, these are oaks, as with so many plants, these are plants that are wonderful, but they just aren't making it in the trade. And when people are not asking for them, they're not being grown and sold. And so that's a process. It takes a long time for a plant to become common in the trade. Uh, but those are two that I would try. Uh, another possibility is cypress there. And we had a, an email also uh, from Vita about uh, cypress knees. Uh, and I'm going to get to that one in just a moment. But uh, cypress, the standard bald cypress, produces knees, especially in soggy conditions. Those wooden knees come up out of the ground, and they are frustrating for mowers, uh, people mowing the lawn because they're, they're mower targets. And when you run through the yard barefoot, you can twist your ankle. Even though you don't see the knee yet, it's this hard thing right underneath the, the visible grass there on top uh, that, that can hurt. And so I'm not a, fawn, a fan of, of ball cypress for landscapes. And I know they're all over Bryan College Station and a lot of other areas of the state, but um, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't plant one as as my tree. I, what I would do is is try to find a Montezuma cypress. Uh, Montezuma is a cypress that is very similar to ball cypress. The growth habit tends to not be more. Ball cypress almost starts off like a Christmas tree with a big central trunk and everything. Uh, Montezuma spreads out a little bit more than that, uh, but it is a very long-lived tree, very resistant to problems, uh, but it doesn't produce the knees. And there's some other cypresses, and again, here's an example of the issue in the trade. Uh, Dr. Creech up at uh, Stephen F. Austin has been uh, looking in and growing this, as well as Dr. Arnold here at the Texas A&M University. They can both tell you a whole lot about cypress. And uh, there are certain um, populations of cypress where they don't produce the knees, and they can cross and things. But uh, if we had, if we could just get rid of the cypress that produces knees, uh, maybe have a few for people that want to have that effect. That maybe put in some Louisiana iris around them and have that kind of effect. But in general, we should be trying the, the cypress uh, species that don't. And, and Montezuma is one of the easier ones to find. Not super easy, but it's possible uh, to find that. So I might try uh, one of those things, uh, Ron, in, in that area as well. Uh, the other email did come from uh, Vita, and it was about do we need to remove those uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the ball cypress tree that's growing knees right up against the house foundation. The tree's 30 feet away. And by the way, I I have some cypress in the place we moved into. I wish I could go back in time about 30 years and, and uh, do something different. But right now, they're beautiful trees that I, I'm not, of course, going to take out. Uh, but I can walk around the side of the house away from that tree, you know, not the opposite side, but around the corner, and be probably 40, 50 feet away, and there's a knee coming up uh, from that tree. And so that is a problem uh, with them. Then, and Vita's question is, so, so do we need to take the tree out, um, and, or, or what can we do? Well, uh, most arborists will tell you that the, the issue with, with trees and, and structures is like if you have a sidewalk or driveway and you have a little tree root that grows underneath it right up near the surface, which they love to be close to within the top foot of soil, if not the top six inches. And then that root gets bigger over time. As it grows in diameter, it's, it's causing a lifting effect on those structures. Uh, on the foundation of a house, uh, it, it's more pressing against the side than it is growing up from down under the foundation. There may be some of that going on, but the biggest issue with trees and house foundations is fluctuating moisture. Uh, the eaves of your house, unless you have um, gutters on them, are, are, that's where a lot of water drops, and that's where it stays moist, and so that's where trees are going to proliferate their root system where there's a dependable supply of moisture. And what happens is we go then in, into summer, and here we are three weeks into no rainfall, and it's 100 degrees outside. Those trees are pumping that soil dry. And in a clay soil, you've noticed the giant cracks that can form in a clay as it dries because it has a lot of shrink swell potential. When it's wet, it swells. When it dries, it shrinks. And so if you've got 
your soil that's moving like that around a foundation, that causes major issues uh, with your foundation. So the trees are more exacerbating that shrink swell movement uh, than they are going up under the foundation and cracking it. And we may have some professional arborists listening that can that can add add to that or maybe uh, uh, adjust that statement a little bit. Uh, but th that that's basically what our concerns are. So I've already commented about the ball cypress and uh, the knees. Uh, I have them in my yard. I just cut them off with a reciprocating saw regularly, and um, not real happy with that. But that it it is what it is uh, at this point uh, in time. But think about it. If you're about to plant one, uh, if you ever want to enjoy that that grass, and but not only mowing it, but letting kids run and play on it, uh, those cypress knees can can be a problem, unfortunately. Let's see. Um, we had a, another question come in from Patricia on ground cover options for live oak shade. So they have a number of live oak trees, and they want kind of a, a rough and tough ground cover that can be underneath there. Not going to get a lot of foot traffic, but it's got a caliche soil. Now, there was the twist that I didn't want to hear, caliche soil. Uh, so what, what are some options for that? Uh, it, if you, if you can water the area, which I suspect maybe that's not real practical, but Asian jasmine is a popular one around underneath live oaks. Uh, it needs light. It can grow in sun, of course, but it needs some light, but it puts up with some shade. The problem with live oak shade is it's almost year-round. There's a period of time in the spring where the leaves fall off as the new leaves come on, but uh, it's almost year-round, and so it's very hard for things to grow in that dense shade. Uh, but Asian jasmine would be an option uh, that you could you could try out. Uh, anything you can do to brighten the shade a little bit uh, would be helpful. There are some native plants that do pretty well. Now they're not, um, for the most part, they're not going to be your flashy, typical, uh, common landscape plants. Uh, but uh, one of them that is very popular in some parts of South Texas as a ground cover is um, horse herb. Horse herb has little uh, leaves and little tiny yellow blooms. And you probably have seen it several times in your life, maybe even have some here and there in your lawn. It's a weed that's hard to get rid of, but it makes a nice ground cover in a dry shade. Uh, it does pretty well. So that, that one may be one to consider. Finding plants of it, again, very difficult. It's not my favorite of the natives. My favorite is one called frog fruit. And frog fruit is all over the place around here. Uh, it's a persistent little weed. Uh, it can take drought. Uh, it, all of these are not going to want to be stomped on with foot traffic, but, you know, a little bit here and there, it can recover from that. Uh, but frog fruit is a vining little small plant that stays very low and has white, uh, little tiny white blooms. Uh, that almost Some people have described it like a little match head sticking up on a stalk with a swollen top, and the little blooms are up there. Uh, but frog fruit is very easy to grow. If you if you know anybody that's got it, they'll probably let you pull it up because they, they're looking at it like a weed. You set those runners on the ground, keep them moist, and they'll root and, and take off growing. And I've seen some lawns, even down in Houston, uh, which surprised me that they would have frog fruit there. But uh, just solid cover, frog fruit ground covers out in sunny areas. Uh, it will put up a little bit with some shade, but not excessive shade. It wants it wants a decent amount of light. So I think, Patricia, we've, you've got a lot of uh, situations there that really limit that list. There are a few sedges, again, native sedges and not native sedges, that are clumping. Think of them more like a monkey grass, but, but much, much lighter color. Monkey grass being dark green and these being almost a chartreuse green. Um, that are clumping, and you can purchase those and plant them. But when you purchase something that's a clumping plant, you got to buy a lot of them to make a ground cover out of it. You got to plant them close so that you know foliage touches foliage, and you get a good solid cover. With things that are vining, they tend to spread and fill in better uh, for you. Uh, so that's just a trade-off to think about. You can. She had asked about putting some bulbs in there, uh, and bulbs can can do really well. Uh, I don't know about the caliche. That's a little bit of a hurdle there. I would I would need to think on that one a little bit more uh, as to what bulbs might be the best in a caliche type soil. Uh, normally we put our bulbs under deciduous trees because a lot of our bulbs, not all, but a lot of our bulbs, uh, they may bloom in the fall 
and then they send up leaves through the winter to replenish, and then when it gets hot, they die back down again. That would be one type of bulb. There's others that may bloom in the spring, but they also have some foliage uh, that comes out in the cool season and is replenishing that bulb before it kind of dies back down again. Daffodils would be a good example of that. And by the first, first type I mentioned uh, for fall bloomers would be like the schoolhouse lilies, uh, oxblood lilies, uh, and the red spider lily uh, would be examples of those. And so in a, a live oak shade, they don't have that replenish season and they're not going to do as well as they would in a deciduous shade. So I think you, you've thrown me so many curveballs on that sentence. Congratulations. <laughs> I, I'm having a hard time coming up with here's your miracle plant that'll do all of the above. But hopefully uh, those comments give you some things uh, to think about. Uh, had a question about planting time for rosemary. Should I plant it now or should I plant it in the spring? The answer is plant it now. It's a perennial. Put it in now. Rosemary is a very tough, dependable, drought-tolerant plant. It wants full sun, and uh, it is not the hardiest plant in the landscape. This last um, amazing winter spell we had uh, killed the rose, most of the, all of the rosemary around Bryan College Station. Uh, but uh, on normal winters, it, it's going to be okay. Since it's a brand new plant, you just might, you know, if we get out in the mid-20s or something, you might want to go out and cover it just to be extra careful. Uh, and the, the rosemary varieties vary in their cold hardiness. They're not all exactly the same. Uh, but, yeah, I love rosemary. I think it's a wonderful, wonderful plant. Makes makes a beautiful shrub, and you get to cook with it. All right. Well, I think, uh, let's see, I believe I caught up on those emails. So let's go back to the phones. Our number, 845-5689. Give us a call at 845-5689. Or if you want to email gardensuccess at tamu.edu, gardensuccess at tamu.edu. Uh, had an email come in from Mike about what's the best way to start spinach from seed. And Mike, we've always said uh, that you, you put them in very warm water the night before you're going to plant them in the garden. Uh, so you, I just get hot water from the tap in a glass, uh, put some um, spinach seeds that I'm going to plant in it, and then put the hot water in it and set the glass on the counter. Of course, it'll, it'll cool off pretty quickly. But being warm, it speeds the, the rate at which it moves into that hard outer spinach seed coat. That's why we make it warm. Uh, and by morning, those seeds will be swelling up. And once you get water into a seed, it starts the biochemical processes that result in germination of that seed, and you get a little spinach plant out of it. So you want to do that the night before and then plant them. Now, uh, about three years ago, I did a little trial with some of the master gardeners, uh, and we, we took spinach seed, uh, several varieties, and we soaked 10 seeds in water and we left 10 seeds dry and we planted them at the same time, same way, same soil. And we found that the soaking gave us, I don't know, a couple days maybe, speed speeded up the, the germination. But it wasn't night and day. Maybe a little bit better stand, although the results varied a little bit. It was a very small scale test. It wasn't you know, replicated research where we have more confidence in the results. But just as an observation, uh, I realized that maybe soaking the seeds isn't as important as I thought that it was before uh, and getting good, even germination. If you plant them well and water them in well in a, in a, in a decent soil condition, you're going to get good germination from your spinach. But that's just a, a little extra tip there that may, may help uh, just a little bit. By the way, if you haven't grown spinach in your garden, you need to try. There is a lot of good varieties of spinach out there. Uh, we did a trial of, I don't know, over a dozen varieties a few years ago and, and saw they almost all of them did really well. Uh, they they were, did well, but some were very large leaf, uh, upright. Um, there's a few varieties out there, and the names uh, will uh, tell you that they're large leaf. There's one that's like mon it's the name sounds like monstrous, uh, and another one that sounds is a Spanish word, gigante. Uh, and so uh, those have large leaves. Why do I bring those up? Well, uh, as people become more health conscious, 
uh, there are even restaurants where you can go and buy lettuce wraps uh, that they put your food instead of putting it in in a, a bun or something like that a tortilla they they put it in a in a leaf of lettuce and you can do that with spinach too but regular spinach leaves aren't big enough to wrap but these large varieties are so that was kind of fun to do that there's a variety called red kitten that you can buy from online seed companies uh, and the the petiole and the some of the leaf veins themselves are kind of a a uh, reddish color. I, they're, there's kind of a reddish pink sort of color. And so it's real pretty. It, it's attractive in salads, especially, to have those colorful leaves in there. Uh, so I, I think people should try growing spinach more. It's a, it's a great plant. Uh, we usually harvest it a leaf at a time, uh, you know, or a few leaves at a time from the plant, uh, rather than digging up the whole plant, but you can do it either way. It works, uh, works pretty well. Our phone number, 845 845- Five six eight nine eight four five fifty six eighty nine, or by email garden success at t a m u dot e d u garden success at t a m u dot e d u. Uh, so let's see. Um, go back to hang on one second. I want to mention a few things about uh, flowers. We we talked a lot about you know the vegetables for fall. Uh, but I do want to say uh, something else about some more of the flowers. So we talked about stock and um, snapdragons and alyssum, uh, calendula, even nasturtium uh, being things that, that do well in the fall. Uh, and then they take you into the winter. They're not our most cold hardy. The most cold hardy are the violas and pansies. Uh, those are just absolutely the best way to have color in the winter winter landscape is violas and pansies. Uh, those they're very dependable come in a lot of types of colors I've become more fond of the violas uh, the pansies have very large flowers but you get a rainstorm on them and knocks them back and it takes them a while to recover and get colorful again uh, and the violas have smaller blooms but they just seem to go 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 and the color options are amazing now you can you can choose uh, from a wide range of colors and, and have a mass of light blue if you wanted or a mass of yellow or something like that, or even maroon. Uh, but th those are great to know that you have those options. But don't forget our foliage color in the winter. This would be ornamental cabbage and ornamental kale. Again, very, very cold hardy like our edible cabbage and kale. And I, I shouldn't say edible, I should say vegetable garden cabbage and kale uh, because you can eat any of the cabbage and kales, even the ornamental ones. They're just not as not as palatable as, as, as the vegetable types would be. Uh, there's also uh, the colorful types of chard. Now, chard won't take a hard freeze, but you could plant it now and get a little bit of color out of it and uh, make a, a beautiful container planting uh, using chard along with uh, some other things in the garden. Uh, in the cool season, we also have uh, the dusty miller. That's a silvery looking foliage that we plant. Uh, and those are nice, especially combined with blue, bluish colored flowers. Uh, makes a nice combination uh, and they're they're pretty cold hardy too and they they do well so uh, don't let winter keep you from having a, a colorful landscape i probably left a few out uh, that uh, from that list but there's a lot of good ones we can have just again remember you fertilize them when you plant them and then uh, or before planting by getting your soil right based on a soil test uh, then water them in with a soluble fertilizer solution if they're transplants and uh, continue in small amounts uh, to give them a boost through the winter. Just remember this about flowering uh, flower bed plants, if you will, the annuals that we use as bedding color. Uh, so those plants can bloom because their leaves are producing carbohydrates. The carbohydrates are the sugars, if you will, won't think of them that way. Those are transported in the plant to fuel the ability to produce flowers or fruit uh, and, and set seeds if they're a plant that does that. If you don't have carbohydrate production, you don't get good bloom production. And so uh, sometimes our plants can sort of bloom themselves into a weakened state. They are just so genetically wired to bloom, bloom, bloom that uh, next thing you know, I had this happen to some petunias for me this summer. Uh, they were just blooms all over them 
But as I got to looking at them after a period of time, you just see there's there's just no leaves, and and you got to have the leaves and the sunlight in order to get that. So there again, a little bit of a shearing back would have helped uh, those uh, petunias, uh, but the little boost of nitrogen to get that growth going. Just always remember that even though you planted them for blooms, you need to support some vegetative growth in order to have a continuing, ongoing cycle of blooms on that plant. Just something else uh, there to keep in mind. Our phone number, 845-5689. It's a quiet day on the phones today. Uh, so give us a call. Let's talk about uh, some things that uh, you're interested in. I want to remind you that uh, we do have our local farmer's markets. I like to talk about those. But uh, every Tuesday from noon to 5, uh, the uh, South Brazos County Farmer's Market, and every Friday from noon to 5, the uh, the uh, also south, uh, I think I wrote these down wrong, but an, another uh, related market. They're at the university, uh, uh, the corner of University and Glen Haven across from Scott and White Clinic. So if you're heading out East University Drive toward the bypass, uh, the last one of the last streets to the right uh, goes is how you would enter Scott and White Clinic, and but it's on the right hand side instead of the left hand side. You'll find the farmers market. Uh, Tuesday, noon to 5, Friday, noon to 5. Also on Fridays from 10 to 2, out on Tabor Road, um, there's a farmer's market there. It's 2861 FM 974, which 974 is Tabor Road, uh, 2861 on Fridays from 10 to 2. And then on Saturdays, downtown Bryan, Main Street and 21st Street, uh, the Brazos Valley Farmer's Market. Uh, and all of these, you, you get all kinds of things from... from um, We'll call them yard eggs or free-range type eggs, uh, baked goods, honey, jams, jellies, uh, canned vegetables, pickles, vegetables. Uh, there's also the uh, sometimes crafts and, and things like that. Uh, I was at one of the farmer's markets a few weeks ago, and we bought some little puppy snacks from a local uh, group that is baking uh, fresh uh, puppy snacks. So if you want to train your dog, you know, that that's a... You're, you're, uh, I have not tried one, but the dog thinks they're pretty good. So, I mean, I think I'm going to let the dog be my opinion on that. But anyway, the farmer's markets are fun. Sometimes a little bit of music going on at some of these uh, in the crafts. And sometimes even a food truck, especially the uh, Brazos Valley Farmer's Market on uh, downtown uh, Bryan at Maine and 21st. They, they will often have food trucks parked there. So it makes a fun outing. Uh, you can even buy a few plants sometimes uh, that pe are seeds that people are selling. So give those a, give those a shot. Support our local, uh, regional farmers uh, as they uh, support those. Another thing, uh, you know, the weather is nicer now. It's kind of a, kind of a, a break from the heat, even though it's going to get in the upper 80s. But still, I mean, this is, we'll, we'll take it after going through summer here. So it's a good time to get out and enjoy things. Now, I've talked about this before, but uh, down in Hempstead uh, is the John Ferry Garden. John, F-A-I-R-E-Y, Garden. You can look this up online, jfgarden.org. Uh, but it's a, a, they have open garden days. Uh, and this month, uh, four times in on Saturday in October, uh, you can go to the open garden days. There's a uh, if you're a member of the garden, they're free. Uh, if you uh, are a non-member, it's 10 bucks for the tour. You want to arrive early, they'll give two tours, one at 10 and one at 11 a.m. And they have a wonderful collection of plants that has been, uh, used to be uh, Yuckadoo uh, in that area, Yuckadoo Nursery. And they have, they've collected some wonderful plants from especially Mexico, but other places. Uh, that you can go see, and that's the John Ferry Garden. By the way, this is the two we have left are the 23rd and the 30th on Saturday. You're listening to Garden Success, and come back next week and let's talk again. You've been listening to Garden Success with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist Skip Richter. Join us again next week as Skip discusses your questions about gardening and landscaping in the Brazos Valley.
Garden Success is brought to you in part by the Arbor Gate, featuring unusual plants, artisan-created decorative pieces, and a constantly changing array of items that bring beauty, comfort, and even flavor to the home and garden. Arbor Gate, 15635 FM 2920, Tomball, Texas, 281-351-8851 or arborgate.com. Garden Success is also brought to you by the Farm Patch, 3519 South College Avenue in Bryan, 979-822-7209. 